Excellent. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, welcome to our brand, Tina. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those that are attending in different offices. Um, my name is Yasha. I head up the marketing organization. I'm excited today to be able to introduce our speaker, and I want to do it under the context of this. Um, as an organization, we have objectives, kind of corporate objectives, and those corporate objectives have one thing in common. They're all focused on growth. The want for growth, the need for growth, the have to have for growth. One of our challenges as an organization, as we move away from the objectives at a corporate level for growth, is to apply those objectives into each one of our organizations. What I find, and I'm three months into the organization, is that one of the first discussions we have is how growth can happen and what the restrictions or the friction points are for growth. And most oftentimes, those conversations are actually first and foremost about resources. Growth is inhibited by the lack of resources. What's interesting, though, is that in fact, growth is not often hindered by the lack of resources. It's a different view into a process that can be effective. And that's why today I'm particularly excited about introducing Hitton. Um, Hitton's going to talk to us about just that topic, growth. A um, couple of, kind of key areas to talk about so that you have some context about what Hitton's done with his professional career. Um, first, from a professional perspective, he's been one of the people in Silicon Valley and in technology generally that has been a very well-established uh, serial entrepreneur. He's funded and grown his own businesses. He's had venture capital invest in other businesses, grown them very successfully. You may have heard of a couple of his businesses, one called Kissmetrics, another called Crazy Egg. From a personal perspective, and this is why I'm really excited about having him here, is that I've had a chance to meet with him multiple times over the years. I've seen him speak many times, and there are a couple of aspects of him personally that are really important and relevant for us here at Mozilla. First and foremost, he is absolutely selfless with his time. Yeah. And that's very important. When you consider the opportunity to learn as an organization, those that have experience need to be able to first have a desire to share their time, then to make that commitment to, their, to share their time. And Heaton's always done that. And the second is that he is an absolutely wonderful mentor. Uh, and with such a broad set of experiences, his ability to come into different types of organization and provide his perspective is incredibly powerful. So with that, please warm, uh, give a warm welcome to our guest today, Heaton Shaw. Thank you. Thanks for having me, um, and everyone in the room, and everyone not in the room. Um, I'm sure there's a way that people that are not here can ask questions at some point. Is that right? Cool. So hopefully there'll be time for questions. I have like 90 slides, and I'm going to talk really fast. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I might talk really fast, so slow me down, somebody, if I'm talking too fast or something. Um, but totally open to questions. Uh, like I said, I have a whole bunch of material to kind of, I wouldn't say get through, but like share more than get through. Uh, I'm not one to get through stuff uh, unless people are listening. So. Again, if anything's off, anything uh, you know comes to mind as I'm talking, please uh, probably not interrupt me, but make sure you save it for the questions, um, and I'll be happy to answer them and discuss it even. Um, so I'm going to get started. Uh, so first of all, uh, I, I like to show this cartoon because pe people always wonder like, why do you, wh why does growth matter? Why is growth important? What is growth? And hopefully we'll get into a lot of that. But uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this scenario, even if like people haven't been this deliberate about it, but like you basically look at numbers and whether that's up or down like this, it's just like, we don't know why it happened. Uh, and when it's down like this, we, we might not have any idea of how to make it better. And this is why we should be all thinking about growth uh, inside of a company. So this is, I think, one of my favorite cartoons about it because it's a very common scenario that I've seen over and over again, which is something goes wrong and nobody knows why it went wrong. Uh, and they also hope that something magical will happen and change things, which is obviously not how things work. Uh, we're not in Game of Thrones. There is no magic uh, that I know of, at least. Um, so first of all, at least everyone that I can see, that would be awesome if you if we just went through and said, what do you do? So apologize for anyone that's not here, but this is really helpful to me. So who's in product? Cool, one person. Uh, design. All right, no designers. Um, engineering, cool. Uh, marketing, awesome. Growth, yeah, I separated that out because uh, I know there's a growth team here. And then sales, nobody, right? Yeah, cool, awesome. No sales people, no douchebags, got it. Uh, kidding. Uh, so uh, regardless of what your job is, what I like to say is like, you're here to make all the things better. That's, that's, that should be your objective regardless of what you're doing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're in customer support, it doesn't matter if you're uh, sort of uh, admin, um, that's, that's all of our jobs if we work at a company, is we gotta make things better. So um, 
how do you make things better? Uh, hopefully I'm here to talk about that. Uh, I know I'm supposed to talk about growth, but I think you can't grow unless you make things better. Um, so my answer, and this is a very sort of standard answer and something that I think obviously a lot of companies are, are sort of privy to and doing a lot of, which is experimentation. Um, even if you don't have a growth team or you know, you're working on product or something like that, it's likely there's a lot of experimentation going on. You might just not know it. Even like being able to do like three or four different mock-ups and do user research is a form of experimentation, at least the way I would define it, uh, because you're basically trying to see if something works or not, and you're also putting it out to some amount of customers, users, whatever, just to see what happens. Um, but one of the things that's kind of core to growth and experimentation is the fact that uh, most tests fail, and this is kind of what a lot of us that have done a lot of experimentation kind of get used to. So, um, you know, when people run A-B tests, a lot of the time there's a lot of connection to um, a certain variation uh, just because you help create it or you're really bought into the fact that it's going to work, hopefully because you learned that it solved a problem for customers, but maybe it's just because you have an opinion. But then you eventually realize once you run enough tests that, like, it doesn't really matter what you think. What really matters is what actually happens when it sees the light of day and people start using it. And experimentation allows you to have an actual comparison. So it's not that, like, again, you will avoid that scenario of the cartoon where something's up or down, you don't know why. If you experiment, you'll actually know why. Um, so again, I think I made the case for it, but like, if you don't experiment, you don't grow. A lot of people think growth is like a strategy because you, know, you get to pick a place you want to get to in the future, hopefully, if you're doing growth decently. Uh, and, and hopefully you can get there, but that has a lot of hope and a lot of like uh, pie in the sky, lick your finger, put it up in the air, make up a number. But really, at the end of the day, growth is actually a result of process, not a result of just like a strategy. Um, so this is something I personally noticed. So one of my businesses, Crazy Egg, was launched uh, about end of 2005. Uh, this is actually the signups over time, uh, and each one of these lines is, I think, a month. Uh, and this is, so this is from, let's say, about the beginning of 2006 onwards. Um, and as of, I would say, about the last 18 months, yeah, I think that's about 18 months, we, we really unlocked a lot of growth even in that business because generally in a SaaS business, they call the slow ramp of, of SaaS, slow SaaS ramp of death or something like that. And we've definitely experienced it. Um, and this is just an example of like, once you, you know, like, like historically in that business, we've been very, uh, not really focus on growth, to be honest, and just letting it sort of grow by itself just because that product, Crazy Egg, it creates heat maps where people are clicking on a page. It's a very unique sort of proposition and has been for a long time. Um, and so it just kept growing. Uh, but then when we actually started getting serious about it, we realized that there's a ton more opportunity than when we attempted some of these things before just because of the way the world is today. Um, we have another product that we purchased in 2012 called Hello Bar. And with that product, this is literally when we purchased it onwards, the same metric of signups. And you can see that we're at levels that took us years to get to at Crazy Egg already with Hello Bar. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why, but um, th the point that I would make here is that like, as time has gone on, growth has actually, from, a, from the standpoint of getting signups, getting revenue, things like that, have got, has gotten a lot easier um, because of all this experimentation, all the sharing that everyone's doing about what's working and what's not. Um, so I'm going to give a few examples of how growth has helped my businesses, and then I'll get more into sort of uh, how, how to do that. So the first one is, uh, we, and, and I have some decks out there about this, but uh, we were trying to insta increase the installation rate of Hello Bar. Hello Bar basically puts a little bar at the top of your page after you insert a JavaScript, so people actually sign up and then they have to actually install it. Uh, and so we, we were able to get a 40% improvement by following the process I'm going to describe. Uh, a little bit later. Um, at Kissmetrics, my other company, um, we had we saw a huge improvement by following the similar process around just getting more signups from a features page. Um, another one would be at Crazy Egg on the home page, after a bunch of testing, we were able to see a 64% improvement uh, on signups. Um, and this one's one of my favorites. We were literally able to double the revenue coming in from our main sort of marketing site uh, using the same process that I'm going to go through. Um, this is still probably one of the crowning achievements, but in, in, in a three-month sort of pretty aggressive uh, uh, sort of uh, experimentation cadence, uh, we were able to get a 300% improvement, so it's like about a 4Xing of uh, our signups. Uh, and I can go through this, so I, I think I'm going to go through it just to give some examples of the kind of stuff we figured out. But 
Um, prior to the way you see this today, where there's like a form field and there's a button and it says login with Google, we had a traditional like name, email, password, sign up form. And when we moved over to um, letting people log in with Google without even putting in any info, so this was before the form field, um, we were able to see a 60% increase in signups just because people didn't have to enter any information in. They would click, most people are logged into Google in the browser, and so they would click again, pick the email, and then they'd, they'd be done. So they didn't have to enter any info, no password, no email. So that was a reduction of two fields. And then the name we got as well, so it was a reduction of all the fields, and it made it like what I call click, click, awesome. They just click and convert it. So that was huge. After that, we tested the copy on the button, and uh, we tested things like sign up, sign in, log in, uh, and even like get started and things like that. And what ended up working is log in with Google. Um, we're, we, we did some research on this, and what we realized is that um, people consider sign up a very heavy thing to do, like, and requires a lot of work, while they consider a login something sort of less, uh, uh, more seamless. And we also were concerned about this. This is a good example of where, like, even we were concerned that like login might be a little deceiving or something like that. But we started, we basically started analyzing how people felt about login uh, after they actually uh, hit the button and got through it by popping up a little survey and just saying, you know, uh, what do you expect to happen next, kind of thing. And they actually expected to sign up for the product, even though when we used the word sign up, there were less people that got there. Uh, so uh, we, we are very sensitive to that as well. Uh, another one, uh, two of these other ones in here that are worth mentioning are when we added a form field where we asked people for their URL, that actually increased by another almost 40% in terms of signups. At first, we were a little confused by this because we had removed all the fields in the beginning and had gotten these improvements, and then we added a field. Um, but this field is very important because it, it basically is the starting of the process of people investing in signing up for this product. <laughs> So we actually did similar surveying with both variations, where one with the website URL, one without it, and we learned that people were getting invested. The words they used were different when they put in the URL or when they didn't. And that was because because we, we enabled that, um, their expectation shifted about what they're going to get next. They essentially thought, and, and we had to do some work here to, 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 to sort of deliver on this promise, but they thought that we would start personalizing the experience from then on because we asked for the URL. And then last but not least, uh, you can see this page, uh, obviously without the metrics and the, in, the green writing, it's pretty sparse. So generally I like things that are pretty sparse because that means that there's one thing people can do and hopefully they do that thing. Um, and so I was skeptical on the link at the bottom. There's a little blue link there that says, want a three minute overview of KISS metrics? Click here. And I was skeptical of even doing it, but we tested it. Um, uh, and it actually ended up increasing signups by 11% because basically we're solving for two different types of people now. So there's people who are ready to ready to use it just by reading it and signing up or ready to sign up. And then there's people who still need more information and we were able to give them an option but yet not get in the way of the other folks. While usually when you do this type of stuff, uh, most people come up with designs that are very distracting for people who, are, who just want to sign up. So our goal was just sort of make sure that everybody that visits this homepage, as much as possible, they get what they want. Obviously, that's obvious. So we, we did a lot of work there. Um, but the results of this, and the reason I explain this is like it, it allowed us to continuously improve and then start getting continuous growth. Because now, as we started increasing our traffic, we were able to maximize our sign up because of that sort of 4xing of our conversion rate. And this 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 started in like the hundreds and it ended in like the tens of thousands in terms of where the graph low point and high points are. Um, but before I get even deeper into the process that I've used to do this, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about product market fit um, and sort of discuss that for a second. So for anybody that wants a definition for this, basically Mark Andreessen gave a great one about in 2006, many years ago I think, when he was blogging a lot more and not tweet storming so much. But he basically said product market fit means being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. It's, it's pretty much that simple. Uh, when you look at this thing about market uh, and, and a product satisfying the market, you, you probably realize really quickly that over time things change, markets evolve, and so product market fit isn't, some, isn't like a steady sort of state. It's something where actually, based on competition, the market and other things like that, things move around, but I've got more on that specific to Mozilla in a sec. Um, so th there's a bunch of ways to measure product market fit, so I wanted to share a few of them really quickly. One is by a gentleman, gentleman named Sean Ellis, where he asked this question, how would you feel if you could no longer use this product? This is just an example from a Slack survey that I, I helped do. And uh, the goal is that you want 40% or more people to say they're very disappointed 
uh, or they'd be very disappointed if your pro product no longer existed. This is a very qualitative uh, approach. Um, and the reason for that is that if that many people believe that consider your product a must have, then it's likely that you have product market fit with a, with, with a good amount of people that you should start thinking about how to optimize and start growing. Um, but if you don't have product market fit, these kind of, this kind of serving can also help you reach it because you'll, you're able to understand how people think of your product. There's a lot, other, lot of other questions incorporated with this and I've got the link right there and I'm sure you'll get this deck after this. Um, so another way to measure it is net promoter score. Um, the reason I like net promoter score is because um, it helps solve some of the debates and I'll talk about some of those later. But basically a lot of times when you run experimentation, you get into this thing where um, people feel like it's going to impact the experience in a negative way. And that generally means that you're making an assumption about the customer base uh, and how they're going to feel. And instead of making the assumption, uh, I tend to take it and try to quantify what we're talking about because otherwise it's a very subjective thing. So how do we turn something that's subjective into objective, uh, sort of an objective measurement? So what you could do if you're worried about feeling um, is you can run this survey as a, and get a baseline of what your net promoter score is. And then based on changes you make or people that are exposed to different experiments, you can also run this on those people to see if there's an impact positive or negatively. So <clears throat> one thing about growth is that like, there's so many things that are qualitative or, or feel like they're not measurable. Um, one thing I've learned is that everything is literally measurable. It just depends on how you think about it. And it's better to measure it than not because at least then you'll know what's going on even if it's not a perfect measurement. Because obviously a net promoter score, a zero to 10 scale isn't a perfect measurement of satisfaction or feeling, but it's, it's better than not having any data. Um, retention is another example of like how to assess product market fit. Uh, basically, uh, this is just a, a normal sort of retention curve. Many people use cohort tables, but what you're looking for is over time, for these groups of people, what percentage of them are active as time goes on and making sure that that's high. So you can see here, if it flattens out, that's actually good. If it starts going all the way down to zero, that's bad because that means you're losing people over time uh, and you probably should do something about it. So a lot of times people worry about running experiments and looking for a conversion rate and stuff, uh, uh, but commonly, uh, some kinds of experiments, uh, it's really good to see which one has a better retention. So if people are exposed to a certain homepage or a certain onboarding experience, you want to measure the, the retention curves for those two cohorts. Uh, oftentimes, not just the conversion rate, because what you're really trying to do is if somebody spent all that time to sign up, you want to make sure that they're actually retained and do whatever you can to keep them around, uh, partly because it's good for them because they actually signed up and tried to sort of make it work. Um, engagement is another thing. Um, if you can if you can get down to how individual people are engaged, that would be awesome. I know there's a lot of, uh, especially at Mozilla, there's, there's a whole bunch of policies and, and kind of uh, ideas around respecting users and stuff like that. There's always a way to do it and keep it anonymous. So uh, I'm sure there might be some questions about that. So I'll save that for the questions though. Um, another thing is churn. Uh, if you have a SaaS business, churn's a big deal. And like, this is just an example of 10% churn, but yet a company getting 100 new customers every month. And you can see it's kind of a flat thing. It's not actually up and to the right. If you keep going like this, it's likely that the churn will, will catch up to you and you'll start decreasing uh, your revenue because the, the amount of revenue you lose compared to the new revenue from 100 new customers every month is greater. And that means you're actually making less revenue every month, even though you're getting a whole bunch of new customers because you're not keeping old ones. Um, so uh, the final piece of this is something that I think we all notice in products that we see. Um, <clears throat> Apple's probably one of the biggest examples of this, but uh, when people tell e each other about it, that's sort of word of mouth growth. Uh, one of the things uh, about growth in general is that um, if you have product market fit, you have a good product, and you've got enough people exposed to it, you're naturally going to start getting word of mouth. And so this is a very natural thing, um, unless you're obviously doing referral programs and stuff. But prior to any of those kind of optimizations or improvements, uh, this is a very key indicator. So early on with Kissmetrics and one of our other products, Kiss Insights, we, we started seeing a lot of tweets like this. You can see this is from 2011. Um, that company, we definitely didn't keep up, so we don't get tweets like this anymore, but that's a different story. But in the beginning, it was something where we, we saw a lot of word of mouth, and that was a great indicator for us that we were sort of close to product market fit. Um, another one is, this one's about Crazy Egg. Uh, I think even a little bit later, people started learning about that product over time, and uh, there's still random tweets about it, uh, and there's some about Kissmetrics there. But word of mouth on Twitter is probably one of the key indicators today, just because it's so easy to tweet, and, and there are enough people on it to get a good gauge. 
Um, outside of that, I do want to make this point and kind of stress this because it's a it's sort of a newer pattern. And, and honestly, I don't see people talking about this, but where a company starts and how it starts actually greatly impacts how the company thinks about growth naturally. So um, many companies end up having product market fit. I have one of them. Crazy Egg had product market fit without us doing anything just because of timing, mostly. So at that time, Google Analytics was a prevalent analytics tool, and we came out with something that was very visual that made it so that you didn't have to look at data. You could look at something visual that any human being could understand, and that that was uh, sort of something that didn't exist before that, so our timing was really good. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you are probably intimately familiar with uh, what happened here. But this is what I'm calling the browser wars. I know I'm missing Safari and maybe a couple others, but I thought the important ones were Chrome, Firefox, and Explorer. Um, so this is from Google Trends. You can go to google.com slash trends. Uh, no, sorry, it's slash insights or something like that. And then you can find the Google Trends thing or just type in Google Trends in Google. Uh, and then I typed in these companies and went all the way back to 2004 because that's, that's the furthest back I could go. And you could see how the, the yellow line being Internet Explorer, they, they've been going down since uh, basically Firefox came out. Uh, and you can see like for a long time there's no competition basically except Internet Explorer and Firefox and everybody else was probably really small. The second, uh, the interesting thing is the second that Mozilla started really catching up to, to Internet Explorer, what ended up happening is Chrome came out and then they started basically taking a lot of attention away. Uh, I'm pretty sure that spike that you see is all the buzz about it early, but it was probably also I'm pretty sure it was related to Google's promotion of it on the homepage. So when you have sort of a competitor like that that could naturally shove a lot of users at something, these kind of things happen. But they also had to, they also spiked down and had to, you know, get the attention back. And again, this is just a proxy. You can see that everybody's, like, it seems like everybody's attention is away from browsers now because it's just, it, it, we're, we're basically, hit, we're not even at the peak of where it used to be anymore. And we're, we're on a decline, most likely because of mobile and how searches are changing now. Um, but at the end of the day, you can see that um, we're lower than, than Internet Explorer right now at Mozilla, but um, it, it, it followed the pattern of basically what I would say a disruption. As Chrome was growing, both Internet Explorer and Firefox were on the decline very consistently, same pattern. Um, and that, that it's just a fascinating thing to, to sort of watch. But I would say that Firefox is definitely uh, a timing sort of business where the origin of it uh, and the initial growth and product market fit had a lot to do with timing. Like I still remember the days when I wanted to use it. I told all my friends about it because I was a geek that had all the extensions and plugins and all that kind of stuff and I had Firefox set up for me. And then as I started using it, I realized that Internet Explorer is so messy that I should also have um, basically any, any consumer, not just a geeky person, sort of start using it. And then once Chrome came out, there actually was a better alternative for that person. While I still think uh, the, the sort of hardcore geek that wants to like tweak everything in their browser, Firefox is still the best for them because you can do that. And there's a whole rich uh, community of people doing that. But now that the market's much different and bigger, uh, there's there seems to be consumers that are that are the ones to target. And that that's something that's difficult to do without actually realizing that you need to grow beyond whatever the natural sort of growth rate is in your sort of market. So again, um, we've seen this a lot, but basically when growth comes naturally, um, it's inevitable that a company is going to get disrupted unless they figure out how to think about growth uh, and think about actually taking the natural fit that they had early and extending that for the long haul. A lot of that has to do with like crossing the chasm and things like that as well. Um, and, and when I see this situation, um, kind of, I feel like Mr. T, uh, where I pity the fool. Uh, so I had to have my 80s Mr. T reference. That was it. Uh, so anyway, so now I'm going to talk back about growth specifically. So one thing that I've learned and one thing that's, I think, important to note, especially because there's all this content, all these tactics and all these things out there, it's never one size fits all. Even the same, pro like similar products, highly competitive markets, it looks like they're the same exact solution. The way they grow is completely different. I think a good example of this is Living Social versus Groupon. I know they're all screwed up now, but like before they were all screwed up, um, Living Social was number two the way that they had to grow was a lot more aggressively than Groupon, who actually kind of had a natural fit once they figured out this model of couponing and scaling through collecting emails. While Living Social had to do innovative things like partner with Pandora early in their ad system to create some unique opportunities for growth and things like that. So growth is definitely not one size fits all. And uh, I'm a dad, so I know how that problem looks with the arms and the legs. Um, 
but uh, I thought that was a good uh, representation of the problem um, because those onesies are one size fits all, but they're still hard to put on. Um, so growth is not a set of hacks. This is uh, one of our, uh, this is our uh, founding team member at Crazy Egg, and uh, yeah, uh, he, he doesn't hack. He, he works on growth all the time, but uh, it, it's really important to know that it's not a set of hacks, even though everything you read about are all 90% of the content, maybe even 99, is about all these tactics and hacks and tweaks and even like how, like even the example I gave from earlier, that's, that's kind of a tactic, right? It's like, here are all the tactics we use to improve this page by 400% or 300%, but that's not necessarily the basis of growth. That's just the tactics of it. And because it's not one size fits all, your tactics have to be very specific. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. There's a site called Dark Patterns. Any of you in the room know the site? Some of you, great. So it's darkpatterns.org. And uh, I actually moved this video to this exact point uh, with uh, Darth Vader. But uh, growth is not dark patterns. It's not about putting these dark patterns into practice. Yes, there are companies that have put them into practice and had a lot of traction with them. But at the end of the day, a lot of times, any of these dark patterns, they end up <coughs> biting you uh, in the long run. They hurt your word of mouth. Uh, they can cause people to have low retention and things like that. So I want to be clear that the things I'm talking about aren't about dark patterns. But at the same time, there are some scenarios where dark patterns actually are required. For example, in social gaming, they make most of their money in the first like seven to 14 days of someone's um, usage. And so there are a lot of dark patterns they use. Now, you could argue uh, either way about whether these are good or bad, but they use these patterns because people are in the product trying to be entertained. And th those businesses are horrible because they're hits driven and people just need to make revenue as fast as possible. So you can see a lot of these companies focus on sort of uh, doing these dark patterns in their case because they're just trying to monetize it. I think we can agree that Zynga is probably the classic case of using a lot of these and then getting screwed over time by losing their brand. I mean, they had, I'm sure many of you know, but they had Farmville like whole like get ups at malls where, where kids could go and all this stuff. Where is all that shit now, right? Well, it's probably because they use all these dark patterns and nobody cares about them anymore. So on that note, growth is a company wide mindset. So it could be bad growth or good growth. If you consider Zynga, it was probably more bad growth where like the, the company got used to this practice of these dark patterns and that's how they made money and then that ended up biting them in the ass eventually and then I think there's sort of more uh, good growth which hopefully I'll talk more about um, so one other thing that really resonates with me and something that I've noticed as a pattern is that growth is very cultural just like the Zynga example is very cultural over there to do all those things that they were doing um, for example at Netflix what I found really interesting is when they talk when they define culture they, said, they say it's what gives Netflix the best chance of continuous success for many generations of technology and people. And to me, that hits on everything Netflix is about. They moved from the mailing DVD business all the way to digital distribution of movies and TV shows and now are making their own content. That hits on the, gener the continuous success through many generations of technology and people. To me, that's growth. That's, that's the innovative culture they have and how they think about growth, which is no matter how people want to consume media, Netflix will be there for you. That's the feeling that they've brought to people outside the company. But the way it happened is because they actually care about this and it's a cultural thing. Um, so I, I stole some of the Mozilla values for, for a couple of these uh, slides just because I want to give some examples of how growth can actually align with your values. So I'm going to go through some of these and, and talk about them. So the, the number, this is two, three, and four, and I have three more on the next slide, but um, I'm going to read them out too, because I'm sure all of you know them, but uh, it's helpful. Uh, the internet is a global public resource that must remain open and accessible. Okay. Uh, so that's probably the open source roots of this business, obviously. Uh, the internet must enrich the lives of individual human beings. Got it. Cool. Uh, it, it, it does, obviously, uh, yeah, hopefully. Uh, individual security and privacy on the internet are fundamental and must not be treated as optional. So, um, you know, I read these and, and when I think about growth uh, and think about how um, subjective these values are, it makes me feel like they need more definition for different parts of this business so that you can define what a global public resource actually is. And, 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 I, and I read some of the material and I know there's some stuff out there, but like to me, these are, these are the values of the company and when you think about growing the business, it has to be aligned with these or these need to change, right? And, and people don't tend to change their values <laughs> very often. Uh, uh, hopefully, you know, some companies reduce them, but overall, companies don't tend to change them. So when I think about global public resource, I think about enriching the lives of individual human beings. And I also think about security and privacy. To me, what I'm, what I, with my growth sort of lens on, I'm like, oh, so we believe at Firefox, if I were just thinking about it like that, that 
you know, the, the, from a growth standpoint, the more people that use our products, the more we can further our mission and our values. And, and that's the way I would think about growth on this. So it's like, if people, do, if enough people don't use our product, we won't achieve these values. We won't, we won't be aligned with these values. So that's, that's one way to think about growth because if they're not exposed and using our products, we cannot help them do these things, right? That's one way to think about it. I might be too blunt about it like that, but I would have that discussion on growth. Uh, and then the, these are other, uh, some of the other values I wanna highlight. So individuals must have the ability to shape the internet with their own experiences on it. The effectiveness of the internet as a public resource depends on interoperability, protocols, data formats, content, innovation, and decentralized participation worldwide. Transparent community-based processes promote participation, accountability, and trust. So the reason I separated these set of values out and I also picked these off, the first ones to me felt like um, quite aspirational and about where, where this company wants to reach and, and how the values align with that. And so that's why I said, to me, growth from that context has to do with getting as many people as possible using our products. Uh, when I think about these values, these values to me shape the execution of growth, right? So if you take individuals must have the ability to shape the internet and their own experiences on it, then a lot of the product is probably oriented around that, which means the growth should the growth, the messaging, the way, the way, the way it's done should probably be, probably be aligned with this idea that I'll, I'll, I'll pen it as like ability to customize my experience on the internet, which to me, Firefox has always been about, you know, just if I use Firefox, I, I get the power tool. Now that this one specific thing might be the contention right now, where if it's a power tool and lots of sort of, I keep calling them geeks and I'll, I'll leave it at that, but like, it's mostly a geeky thing, then getting, getting past this would probably mean there's simplification and things like that that you would want to do um, if you were to get to the normal consumer. Uh, this whole public, re the effectiveness of the public resource, interoperability, innovation, decentralization, to me, if I were running growth and thinking about growth here, um, I take that and say, okay, the way we operate, the way we execute should be aligned with these things. So they should be using the standard data formats. They should be actually trying to promote those, try to probably even educate people on how experimentation, experimentation and testing can be used in these ways. Um, you might even try to, even though Optimizely and things like that exist, you might actually go pull out and use more of the open source tools that are out there instead of Optimizely, if you really value some of these things. Um, and then the last one, the transparent community-based stuff, I, based on the wiki and everything I've seen, I feel like, um, at least the transparent part seems to be covered just in the way this company operates as a whole. Probably also the way it has to, considering the, the nature of the company. But the other part about this community-based processes, I think all that stuff, uh, participation, accountability, and trust, that probably needs to be evaluated from a growth standpoint. It's probably a deeper discussion to really figure out how does growth handle those things? Because the truth is like growth is tends to be a very internal process inside of a company. And like in many companies, it's it's a team that's responsible for mostly ushering growth around the company. But at the end of the day, as I said earlier, it's a company-wide process. And th this value is one of them that's probably super unique to this business and probably needs to be sort of evaluated when it comes to growth and how can we be community-based and transparent, but yet obviously not hurt our growth you know, too much because we're doing that. Because some of these things can get in the way of growth when you require so much approval and things like that from your community, depending on how you define it. Because a lot of times the experiments you run, they fail, they don't work. So getting so much buy-in from the community can lead you to have to optimize towards a failing experience just because they're bought, bought in. And and that's, that's partly why I wanted to bring up these values because growth has to be aligned with your values or it's not gonna happen here. It's just gonna be people you know, hitting their heads against the wall. And, and I mean that because I've seen it. So uh, they have to, it has to be aligned with the values and that discussion probably should happen. Um, so here's another values thing I like to talk about. I like Legos obviously, but uh, the, the, the concept is uh, pirates and explorers. So, uh, it, you know, you can look at a company and figure out who they actually are just by thinking about it like this. So explorers tend to uh, think about everything they're doing as uh, revolutionary, not even evolutionary, but like, you know, we're different and hopefully we're different and right. Uh, and that's what an explorer is. I, I personally tend to be an explorer. Pirates tend to be uh, people that uh, <laughs> think about competition a lot and think about like, how do I get what someone else has, basically. So if they were looking at those those trends graphs, they'd be like, how do we, how do we take Chrome market share away? And that's how, that, how, that's how those people are driven uh, mentally. And uh, for me, uh, every company is on some spectrum between these two. 
And the definitions look like this. So explorers are discovery centric. They tend to be first movers or early movers into a market or an opportunity, and they tend to focus on solving problems. While pirates tend to be more market centric, so competition, alternative, things like that come to their minds a lot. Uh, they tend to be fast followers, so they'll see something really neat and they'll be able to build it faster than anyone else. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong, it just means they'll be able to build faster. And then the last note is they build solutions. So since they're not really looking out for problems, they're generally looking out for things that are popular in the market or things that might get popular that they should add. So they're doing a lot more copying and fast following really fast. And the way their organizations are set up are set up to support one of these two functions. Um, over time, companies tend to need both sides, um, but most companies are always skewed one way or another. I, I like to call it a spectrum just to be nice to people, but like ultimately businesses are either one or the other in, in, in my sort of experience, and, and they really lean heavily towards whatever they've developed. And even looking at a company's org structure, you can probably figure this out. So this is kind of, I didn't want to leave you with like, oh, growth is cultural and everyone should think about it in a company and it's a mindset and then be done with it. I think there's exploration about what is this company and how, how do we operate, how do we think about some of these things and then adding, adding, figuring out how to get growth based on that uh, and also figuring out what areas are worthy of change, right? If they're gonna get in the way of growth and things like that and having that discussion. Um, so again, I stress this already, but like do what's right for your company culture. That's probably the biggest lesson I can give a company like this that has very specialized and also quite subjective values just from reading them because um, values are already subjective but when they're really high high level uh, it can be tricky to navigate them uh, and then the last thing is um, I would inspire all of you to think about uh, how do you treat this company like your own little lab and, and actually run more experiments faster in all kinds of areas so we we've discovered that you can experiment in every area of a company and if you think about it like that you're more likely to understand what why how uh, of what you're doing and less likely to just do things and ha have to guess, just like that cartoon in the beginning of not knowing why something is up or down. Um, so now I'm gonna go into the experimentation process. It's stuff, much of this stuff is probably things you've seen, but I've tried to organize it to explain the process that I use. This is all uh, from like books like Lean Analytics all the way to this guy Avinash who writes about analytics to sort of things that I've learned over time, but it, it's a simple four step process and I'm just gonna jump right into it. So um, so the first first step is data. Uh, you need data. You can't really do anything on growth without data. Uh, data helps you figuring, figure out what to improve. So um, obviously, uh, Alice in Wonderland, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So data helps you figure out where to go. Um, this is one of my other favorite cartoons. Uh, no, everybody knows you can't drive with no window, right? or tinted glass in the front, uh, and, and that means you'll be blind. And again, it's it's the advocating the data. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Um, so first of all, data doesn't make decisions for you, so this is really important to stress. A lot of people believe that um, you, know, you look at the data and whatever the data says you do. That's not true. Um, what data does is it informs your decision making. The reason for that is if you just do things based on data, you're not going to account for the company, the culture, the values, and the opportunity ahead, and you're just going to make sort of iterative decision making based on data. So I can't stress it enough, and, and honestly when I say this, people usually have a sigh of relief uh, just because um, data is a little bit daunting and it doesn't actually tell the full story. Um, but it does help you identify the most painful problems people have. So. Um, I'm going to start with quantitative data and just give a, a quick framework. Um, simple thing is, when you're in doubt about what to improve, just look at your top pages. In fact, look at your top anything. Figure out where there's a lot of volume and then see what you can do about that. See whether you can make an improvement or not. Even if you're not running an A-B test, finding out where there's a lot of volume is really important because those are probably the areas that are worth improving and they're the ones that you're going to usually see the most impact. Um, I came up with a simple framework. Uh, as I was presenting, and I didn't have the framework, but I was presenting like uh, a few uh, scenarios I'm gonna show you, and somebody came up with this little graph. I have a prettier one later. But basically, um, if you're in Google Analytics, and these are just examples of finding opportunities with data, and really simple examples, but if you're in Google Analytics, you can go three levels deep in the navigation, find your landing pages tab, and then basically find, find pages that have a high traffic and a high bounce rate, and those are all very easy opportunities to like run A-B tests. Um, this is a product like Unbounce. So if you have a bunch of landing pages, you can do the same where you find opportunities where you have a lot of traffic and a lower conversion rate than any of your other pages. 
Um, this is just with email marketing or any kind of channels. You're basically looking for high traffic opportunities with low conversion rates, same thing. Um, and I, I've got a little graphic here, so let me just describe it. But basically, um, if you have things that are high traffic, low conversions, you'll be in the top left quadrant. And in that case, you're trying to increase your conversions so you can have high traffic, high conversions. That's a great place to be because you, you can do A-B testing in that scenario. If you have low conversions, low traffic, you're going to need to get more traffic before you can actually do A-B testing. So in that case, in case you have a scenario like that today and it's an important page or important area, the things you can do outside of running A-B testing is do a lot of user research and usability testing, whether it's through usertesting.com or yourself, just to understand the problems people have and just try to make improvements without even testing them, just so that you're sort of making the page better. And generally, you make the page better, you get more traffic, and then you can put it in another quadrant, hopefully. Uh, and then the high conversions, low traffic, it's obvious, it's a good page, it's working, you want more traffic. But what you're really trying to do is get it to the, get everything to high traffic, high conversions, uh, and do whatever you can to get things to that place, because that's when sort of growth really gets unlocked, when you have a lot of channels that are high traffic, highly converting. Uh, all you're trying to do is make sure you don't screw that up and uh, lose the conversions. Um, now I'm going to talk about qualitative data. So uh, again, I stressed this earlier, but like uh, one of the things that I see, again, people make mistakes of is they think of data as just quantitative. So these are all these numbers and these charts and things I've shown. But really, at the end of the day, qualitative data is just as important. Oftentimes, it's more important uh, because it helps you stop making assumptions about people and how they feel and what, even what they think and say. So uh, a few quick tools, usertesting.com for user research, SurveyMonkey. Um, there's a tool called Qualaroo that'll do a pop-up survey on your page. There's a bunch of other tools that do that too now. Uh, but basically, on your website, you can pop up a survey. I've got some examples of some uh, that are really useful. And then, and then live chat's always been really powerful for us as well. When, when we put that up, we learn, we learn a lot more from a different point of view. It's actually people on the site that actually have questions. And we've used that information not just as a customer support tool, but as a tool to learn more about visitors and what they're confused by, and then sort of solving their problems from there. Um, exit surveys are really cool because when people try to exit, you can pop this up. This is just a survey. It would be on the bottom right. It's not very obtrusive, and people do fill it out. And when people, it's basically about identifying intent. Their intent when they try to close the window is to close the window. And so that's a great point to actually understand why are you trying to close that window? Uh, why did you not do what, what we want you to do on this page? And so I would run this survey just to figure out why there's a high bounce rate on a page. So if I identified a high bounce rate page or a low conversion page, I would pop the survey up when they try to close it just to understand. And you know, I know that there might be some people that say, oh, this is, this is you know, aggressive, obtrusive, whatever. Um, in my experience, the way you can solve some of those things is all based on the copy you use in the box. So if you use very friendly copy and very respectful copy, maybe even overly respectful copy, just because that aligns with your values, you're good. You're doing the right thing for the customer because you need to understand why they're not converting. If they're on the page, their intent is to convert. Like That's generally what it looks like. And if they're not, that page is not sufficient for them. You're not doing the right job for them. So uh, that's the way I would explain um, this when, when I get pushed back on kind of running these kind of surveys, because that happens a lot. Um, uh, another one would be, and this is one I like to run on any website, but it's basically on any page, ask people, were you able to find the information you were looking for on this page? Yes, no. And then if you do this on a lot of your pages that are key, you'll start getting a score between the yes and no. So what pages have, have more, yet, you know, more yeses than no, or what pages have a 60, 70% yes? But the key here is when they say no, you can ask them, like, why'd you say no? And then once you, once you ask them this, you'll figure out all kinds of things about pages. So we've run this on e-commerce sites and learned that something buried really low on the page is really important to a lot of people. And because they're not getting the answer, they're not purchasing. And then when we move those things higher up in the page, guess what happened? People purchased more and they got what they wanted. So this is a really key one. Um, and then last but not least uh, on, on the data side uh, is... Um, uh, in my experience, especially currently, user research really has a big impact in helping you learn a lot about people really fast. So these days, we won't actually write, write even, I mean, if, if, we're, if we're designing something, we'll, we'll actually design multiple variations of it and throw it to user research and kind of wait till we get some results back before we even continue and make progress on it. Just because anything we do is just something we think is right. It's not necessarily something we know is right. And so this is a way to like not waste so much time on engineering or front-end engineering or whatever, or even implementing something and learning a way up front uh, whether something is more directionally correct or not. Um, next is the hypothesis phase. So that's where you're making an educated guess. 
Um, so these days, when I hear people talk about ideas, designs, or solutions, um, first I'll ask them, why is it that way? So why did you, how'd you come up with this design? And depending on how they came up with the design, I'll either learn that they were just making assumptions that they thought were true that really aren't necessarily true or they haven't validated, uh, or I'll learn that they actually went through a process of having a bunch of assumptions, learning a bunch about the data, and then going through it. So, so the thing I've learned is that when I hear ideas, designs, and solutions, I'll always go back and say, oh, that's just a guess. So we're just guessing. And I'll, I'll take the stance that we're just guessing, and then I'll turn those things into assumptions that we have, just so that we can be more deliberate about knowing why we think that solution is going to work. So even if you still go with the solution, you should write up or at least think about why you think it's going to work. Um, I think everything can start with a testable hypothesis, but it takes a lot of practice. Um, so one example, this is from Optimizely for actually running experiments. Uh, they actually have a whole sentence uh, that they have you or they would recommend that you fill out. So if, let's say, a website element changes uh, in some way, then we expect um, more people to sign up, for example, uh, due to the fact that um, that element is really important and today it's really low on the page, for example. And if you go through this process and you write enough of these out, you start learning that like, if you want a more educated guess, you have to do the data stuff better. So you have to go get more qualitative data or get more quantitative data to be able to actually rationally write out one of these. And so this process is very good in helping you rationalize and understand why you're actually making a decision or, or creating a solution. Uh, another example would be um, if you really want to get into the data, you can estimate how uh, something's going to impact your conversion rate or any metric. So if you've taken, taken the opportunity to look at data, found a problem based on data, then the onus is on you to estimate how your solution can make an improvement. And once you start kind of doing this, uh, the next level of this is basically taking any of your test ideas and turning them into these equations and being able to give some sort of idea of what we should work on or what experiment we should run by basically prioritizing them. So the, in this example at KISS Metrics, when we were doing a lot of that experimentation I described with the homepage and even other pages, we got all the way down to what did we think it was going to increase our revenue by, by based on what improvement we think we were going to get from each test. And that really changed a lot of things. One. We got better at guessing once we got the data back that it either it worked better or worse than we thought or the same. Uh, so then we got better at guessing and, and we also got better at prioritizing. So this documentation around testing can be really helpful. Now, in the case of Mozilla, when I think about transparency and things like that, these all feel like things that could just be published out there for people and they could understand what this business is going through to get growth, right? That, those are the things I think about from a value standpoint. Uh, experiment. So uh, next, once you have a hypothesis, you want to start experimenting. So the biggest stuff I have in this category is just best, best practices and some ideas for testing that are really simple and easy. So um, uh, you'll see out there that there's some case studies around like changing button color. Uh, but when you look at those case studies, you'll notice that most of the button color changes don't have, if any improvement, the improvements are like 15 to 20%. They aren't dramatic. If you look at most of the improvements I, I, sh I showed you using our process that we've done, they're all way more than 20% for the, for the most part. Um, so no button colors, please. Uh, another one, uh, which is <laughs> another pet peeve, many years ago, 06, 07, 08, somewhere around there, 37 Signal, now Basecamp, put out this blog post that said when they put C plans and pricing on their buttons, they would get a higher conversion rate. I think it was like 30, 40% higher. So for a long time, even right now, there's a whole bunch of sites out there that are SaaS sites that sell, you know, that are basically trying to get you to sign up for their web app that basically use the same exact copy. And when I looked at some of these sites, uh, none of them were actually testing and testing the stuff for themselves, at least from what I could tell. So you shouldn't copy these best practices blindly. You should definitely test them for yourself because what works for you won't necessarily, what works for them won't necessarily work for you. Um, and I don't want to leave you with just that. So I wanted to give an example of better buttons. So uh, the one, there's one on the right that says, show me my heat map. That's from my business Crazy Egg. Uh, at one point, we couldn't find anything to beat that copy. If you think about that copy, it's speaking to the person, right? Or they're spe actually speaking to themselves, but uh, it's a little bit of a different story. But basically, all of these are specific to the point where just by looking at the button, you might have a decent idea of what the product is going to do for you. And that's really important when you think about copy, especially buttons, about being very specific, uh, partly because people can see the generic call to actions on every site, like get started and things like that. And, and they're kind of drowned out by things they see on other sites, uh, especially the copy and buttons. So having things like create a gift, 
finish and create site, things like that are very specific and tend to have a higher conversion rate. Um, another one, this is one of my favorite ones. When I see long pages, right away I'm like, can we just run a test where we uh, try to understand what people care about or not on this page? And as all of you may know, like I'm a, a by now I'm a fan of like minimal pages with one goal. Uh, and so when I see these, I'm like, all right, I want to know what's working, what's not, so we can do less on this page. Uh, so one example is this is an example from Unbounce, one of their landing pages, and they have um, a diagram at the top. So I, I gave the example here where like the original, and then what we removed, which is the diagram and what the page looked like, and then you would run a test and see. If you, if you learn that the conversion rate didn't change, basically that graphic did, doesn't matter. Like it doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't get more people to sign up. Um, another one that's a pet peeve of mine is uh, throughout the years, about the last 10, 12 years, um, I, I think we're drowning in sort of social proof and logos. So these are like four different uh, sets of logos, all from four different sites. Uh, and so, you know, these days, the thing I like to make fun of is, yeah, everyone's got Salesforce and Facebook as a customer, but does that mean anything? So uh, on that Unbounce landing page, they have a quote and they have a bunch of logos. So what if we just kill those and then test it and then see if social proof matters? So again, when I see a long page, the first thing I want to do is run sensitivity testing to understand what actually causes visitors, what actually moves visitors, like what makes them sign up, what doesn't. Uh, it's a really quick test to run and you could probably run it on a ton of your pages and get a good idea of what's going on. Um, so this is the last step, which is like, what do you do after sort of the A-B testing? Uh, if many of you haven't seen an A-B testing report, here's one from one of my products, Kissmetrics, that we let you see. Um, it's just standard stuff, uh, and, and, and all the testing tools have gotten much better about telling you what this data means, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, one of the things we learned is um, by documenting every A-B a -B test before we do it, and also adding the results into this thing allowed us to create a playbook that has had an enormous amount of benefits. So uh, our, our stuff, um, this is exactly a list of what we do. So it's we start with a hypothesis. Uh, we give the dates we ran the test, screenshots of all the variations, even the expectation from it, the probability of it once actually the data comes in, uh, screenshots of the raw data, uh, and, and then also a decision uh, that you made from the test. Uh, that's one that we actually added a little bit later. And the last one that we added that really changed a lot of things for us is what we learned from the test. Um, and the reason for that is you really want to figure out what learnings do you want to carry over from the past. Because once you start doing a lot of experimentation and you even try to grow your team, what happens is people come up with ideas that you already had. They might even be ideas you already tested. So if you haven't documented them and have this stack of learnings and maybe a playbook, again, all here, all things I think you could make public um, to, to be transparent and you know involve the community, whatever that means. Uh, you will basically avoid decreasing conversions. You, you'll avoid like double work too. Now that doesn't mean that you, because you ran a test and something failed in the past, doesn't mean you, re, you don't rerun it or reevaluate it. But if you had the documentation and know what happened, you'd know when to do that or when not to do that. Um, so then what happened is once we started creating those playbooks, what we realized is we ran enough experiments that we can create checklists for different areas of the product. Right? And these are just loose guidelines on what we learned and what, what we should be thinking about when we try to create new experiments or new designs for this page. So this is actually one from that home page I showed earlier. Keep the footer links, autofocus on the first form field. So right when people hit the page, they're already in the form field with the little cursor. We've tested that. That tends to get a 10 to 20% bump on any site I've tested it on, where you just put the, the cursor there right in the main field that they need to fill in. Uh, don't include social proof. I think you've already heard my pet peeve on that and the testing uh, link to the features page and then the login copy. So these are all specific things that we learned through literally more than five tests. It's probably like 20, 30 tests. We learned that these are the things that matter. And so we create these for every area, every page, just so that um, whenever someone creates a design, uh, they actually know kind of what we've already learned and sort of follow that guideline. Or they have a very good reason not to and they talk about that reason in their write-up. Um, so these are a few last parting thoughts. One, can't stress this enough, but like, uh, a solution, a design, an idea, those are just, that's just an assumption. And so what you're really trying to do is as fast as possible, take it from an assumption and an opinion and turn it into a fact. And this is like what experimentation, testing, getting data actually does for you, which is when you have an assumption, a question, or an opinion, you should go figure out whether it's right or wrong. That's actually what you're trying to do. And you don't want to wait till you build something, change something, put it out there, and then hope that something changes. Instead, you want to be a lot more deliberate so that you're more likely to be right than wrong about what you're trying to do. Uh, next, uh, this is 
uh, th this is the probably one of the hardest things, but like if you're not testing, you're not learning. And the way we learn isn't through testing as we grow up, unless we were like, uh, you know, in the science lab all the time or something like that. So, you know, one of the things that I've done is I went and uh, I have friends that work at labs. I've actually watched them at the lab and just understood how they think about the world and how they do things. And like, it is like this, they, everything's a test. Everything's documented on like paper, believe it or not. And like, and, but they're dealing with like complex, usually bio biological and different problems with lots of variables. But the way they do it is at the labs and using the scientific method is all that we're talking about. It's like, it's just the scientific method. That's all I just talked about, not anything else. It's just applied to what we do today. And, um, you know, uh, this is kind of like probably the, the final thought I would have on this, which is basically if you don't have a process, even if it's lightweight to start with, which it probably should be, um, you won't continuously improve because what will happen is you'll reevaluate, redo things that you already learned and already did. And I painfully went through six months of like doing that once. And it was just horrible because we just kept coming back to the same stuff because we never really wrote a lot, enough stuff down. And so our, our growth stalled, our, our, the improvements we were able to make stalled. Uh, we, we, we even let down our customers a lot of the time. So, you know, the, the, the thing I'll say about this continuous improvement too is like, yeah, because it's, because there's in every market today, it tends to get crowded really fast if it isn't already crowded. Doing this stuff is the only way to actually do the right thing for your customers. Even when I started the, the first SaaS product, Crazy Egg, back in 05, um, it was so much easier. We had natural product market fit because people didn't have that many analytics tools they could use or that, that were providing value to them. And so the market was limited and so it was easy, right? Now, if you even look at your market, especially in terms of browsers, there's I'm sure if I just pick on one of you, you can name 10 browsers for me right now that I don't even know about, right? Uh, or I don't think about anymore. I probably knew about them years ago. So because these markets are crowded, people have a lot of options. And if you aren't really thinking about experimentation and growth, you're just not gonna grow. Because it's not that easy to actually keep somebody. I actually think it's easier than ever to get somebody to sign up for something, download something, but it's, it's harder than ever to keep them because it's so easy for them to switch. And you know, the world's obviously completely different than uh, when this company started or even when I started. Um, so last but not least, uh, my, my advice or my, my opinion is you should all work on things that matter and you should all make those things better. That's everyone's job in a company and that tends to make everybody happier. So that's what I got and I'm totally open for questions if you have time. Yeah, two minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and my email, you can pass it around too. I'll take questions by email as well, and I'm always happy to help. Um, as, uh, as was said earlier, I'm a really helpful person, but yeah. Awesome. So all, so all the uh, examples you get, you've given are from websites, which have the, the great fortune of being able to do uh, really rapid iterations of testing. Yeah. A lot of our products are desktop, mobile-based software, which, yeah. we, which, which you can do similar testing, but it's yeah. more onerous and, and takes longer amount of time. <laughs> so the, essentially the costs of doing the tests are much higher. Any, any ideas or suggestions on how to minimize or maximize the impact of these tests and minimize the cost so that we get the most value out of the test that we do? Yeah, um, the brute force answer is lower the cost of that testing. So that tends to mean you spend your first, uh, your first phase of like, let's say, let's say it's Firefox desktop, right? You would spend the first phase of a growth initiative to figure out how to make it easier to actually run subsequent tests. If you had uh, experiment plans and knew what kind of experiments you wanted to run, then you would build tech that would support running those experiments. That's the brute force answer. Um, the tactics are all about being able to load things dynamically and things like that, right? But there's no short right answer. I have done tests through things. I've done. I've done tests on sales processes, which is harder than running tests on the desktop, right? Just because the, there's a lot of variables. All customers are different, right? And you might have low volume, so. You know, another thing to think about is, and, and I mentioned this in the talk, but if you have constraints like that and you know that it's going to take time to build that tech or whatever, because it's just a time problem in most cases, right? It just takes time to build that stuff. Then you might spend more time in the beginning just so that you can keep making progress doing a, sort of like a 
an extreme amount of research, user research, usability testing on those areas, just so that you can impact all the learnings in, and you might even find the quick fixes. And those quick fixes don't necessarily need to be tested if they're just blatantly obvious. And usability testing, user research, I, I found the most blatantly obvious stuff there where I, I wouldn't run the test. I wouldn't even test it. I'd be like, oh yeah, that, everyone, everyone hits that problem, right? Like 15 out of 20 people said that, right? Just fix it, you know? So, so my advice would be uh, usability testing. That's also what I would do if you had a low volume, because that's another scenario. You probably don't have that problem here, but in some areas you might. If you have low volume, just spend a lot more time on user research. And user research has become a pretty core part of our data side of things so that we can learn more information first. That's been really helpful. That's fine. Yeah. I can even repeat it. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. I was just gonna say I, I love the way you connected growth to our values. Yeah. Um, it's a really important investment in your yeah. um, I know. Yes, of course. And um, we're going through a cultural change as yeah. we think about growth into the company. We have a growth yeah. team that's doing some great work. They're yeah. supporting work, grows work across the organization. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you have advice on just resources that the team should plug into um, as we go on this kind of cultural transformation. Yeah. Um... There's definitely a lot of content out there. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. The question is resources around basically as you transition the, the company and start thinking more about growth and even the culture to some extent, it sounds like. Um, I think the resources out there, unfortunately, aren't about this thing about how to align growth to your values. The reason is most of the stuff we hear about out there is um, early growth teams, early growth initiatives. We don't really hear about maturity on them. So we haven't heard about how they got there, and they also tend to be much smaller, less culturally established companies. Uh, and, and the hacks for some of these companies, and, and I'm just gonna describe them, which probably wouldn't work here, is they just actually create new initiatives and, and, and take those out of the processes and systems that exist. It's a solution. I don't believe it's the right solution here, and I, I, I've seen it work though, but then it's hard to get it back into the core business. And here I think there's a core fundamental shift that uh, you, you all are trying to make. So my, my advice would be just have the discussions about values, but have a basis of knowing that, just having this thinking that if we don't get more people using uh, our products, then we're not gonna be able to show them the value and, and the way we think about the world and and how, you know, how it could be. And so I think there's a fundamental first shift I would just try to make if I were to give advice on this like this is, can you get the whole company to be aligned around more people should should use our products? That's the simplest thing about growth. You're just trying to get more people to use the product. You're not trying to get more people to sign up. You're not trying to get more people to download. You're trying to get more active users, basically. And so once you align around that, and then you have the values discussion, I think things probably would be thought of differently. Because I haven't heard anyone, sometimes I have to argue with people a little bit, but I haven't heard anyone win an argument with me when I say that. When I say we're trying to get the most amount of active users as fast as possible. The reason is that's how we actually support our business and that's also how we how we actually align with our values, right? And, and that's why I pointed out the Netflix one. I think their statement on what they believe culture is, is actually just, we believe culture is growth. That's the way I would describe the way they said it. So um, just, if you're actually in the process of realigning some of the values, I would just put that lens on them. Because I think there are a few there that are gonna be challenging to support from a growth standpoint. Uh, and so those should be discussed. But that's the advice. I mean, it, it's an internal discussion. I don't think there's outside resources that are gonna help you beyond process and tactics today. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, thank you all. Thank you. You've been awesome. I just, you can't leave Mozilla without swag. I'll take it, awesome, thank <laughs> and you. And this is for you to notate all those Sweet. tests that you are Awesome, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Woo! Thank <laughs> you.